Hello, One Soccer fans and friends. Welcome to another episode of The Hangouts, uh, one of the many shows here on the One Soccer YouTube channel. Another good show to watch tonight. Gareth Wheeler going inside the game with Tim Bezpachenko. But first, yeah, half hour hangout with myself, Asa Raymond, Kurt Larson, Oliver Platts, and a special guest getting called up. We were supposed to have Julian Boucher in, but no, it's an impact sub. That's right, Dylan Sacramento stepping up, answering the call. We're happy to have him on, formerly with the Valor FC, currently with the Gull United and the League of Ireland First Division. I understand you're back home in Winnipeg right now, Dylan. How are you uh, holding up in self-isolation? Yeah, good. I mean, uh, with my girlfriend, she was with me in Ireland. And then uh, when everything kind of got put on pause and hold, we decided to come home before it get too tough with the flights and everything. So, yeah, we've been home for uh, over a month now. <laughs> And pretty much been, you know, in the house and doing everything like everybody else. But uh, everyone's healthy and uh, we're happy, so it's okay. Before we get into the uh, questions uh, in our hangouts, I know that Kurt has one that he has to. He wants to get out of the way. Oh. Uh, Kurt, uh, you have a score to settle with Dylan. What's up? <laughs> well, I think our producer prepped him for this. So I think he knows what's coming. But I'm just wondering why, Dylan, you have decided to dodge my podcast through the years, dating back to last year multiple times. Uh, what do you have to say for yourself for saying you would be on my podcast and then not showing up? Uh, I think, uh, you know, in that Dominican time, there was a lot of unexpected meetings. So, you know, I just, something popped up and couldn't make it, man. Sorry. I, uh, I swear, uh, I, I swear that I could hear on the phone in the background, drinks being had, glasses <laughs> clanking, a good time being had. So I'm not, I'm not buying it, but I'll, I'll, I'll let it go finally because you have explained yourself. Okay, okay. Who, who is oh, your uh, replacement? Yeah, for now. <laughs> who did no, you get I, instead, Cut? Sorry? Huh? Who did who you did get instead? instead? I don't know. I think it was Mason Trafford, if I remember correctly. But uh, we, we were sour. We were sour for a little bit. <laughs> Curtis, sounds like Valor was having a good time in the preseason camp before the season got underway. But it was a struggle throughout the year. You had an 11-game uh, winless streak dealing with Valor FC. What went wrong with Valor? I think at the beginning of our first few games, I thought maybe those were our best performances from almost the whole season. Like we beat Pacific at home. I think we had a strong showing in our first game of the year. We were, you know, we looked ready. We looked good. Um, second game against Edmonton, we lost at home, but we probably should have won that game. Um, and then, you know, we had some key injuries. Like if you look at a guy like Joseph Golubar, no one really talked about him, but I did such a good player. And, you know, he, he goes down with an ACL and that hurts the team, right? So then we're always kind of looking for solutions. And uh, I don't know, it was, it was tough during that, you know, 11 game winless spell. We we're obviously, we're changing lineups a lot. Uh, you know, kind of hard to find a, a constant fluidity in the team. Maybe there wasn't a, a cohesiveness in the group that, you know, allowed us to be on the same page uh, throughout the games. And it obviously showed that, you know, there was something that wasn't clicking for us whether and that was maybe defending as a unit and even progressing as a unit going forward it was a little bit sporadic maybe a little bit individual in that sense and you know we had a lot of good individual goals um but you know as a unit we we were you know we we struggled against the the teams like Hamilton and and, and Calgary because they they suffered they suffocated you almost right like they knew uh, organization wise, it was, it was tough to break down a team like that, first of all, and then going forward, they're also very good. So, you know, if, if you're not on the same, same wavelength as them, it's going to be a tough game. And, and those games were hard for us. And then, you know, we never really got in a rhythm. We'd win a game and then probably lose a couple or, you know, we didn't put two, two back-to-back -back wins together uh, throughout the year. So we never really caught any momentum. I remember just thinking back to the broadcasts last year, Dylan, and I want to bring Oliver in on this as well. Uh, it, it seemed like you had a lot of talented attacking players, a lot of players with experience, but also a lot of similar players in, in guys like Bustos and yourself. And then you put Carrero in there, Petrasso, is he, you know, where's he going to play on the field? And you know, Oliver, I don't know if you agree, but we oftentimes struggled to pinpoint what your guys' best unit was going forward. And it seemed like you guys were all rotating through positions. Um, was it, you know, was that something that, that was difficult to, to, uh, to manage throughout the season? Yeah, I think so. I mean, when you put yourself into the, you know, your, yourself as a player, you obviously want to be playing in the position that you're most comfortable in and that doesn't always happen. 
Um, and then I don't think, I don't think maybe we were dynamic enough. Like you said, maybe we had, we have a lot of good technically talented players, but then, you know, maybe we didn't, we didn't utilize enough speed to, to get runs in behind or to, you know, actually be unpredictable against teams. I thought we, we were probably pretty predictable going forward a lot of the time because we were trying to, you know, find, find Petrasso on, on an outlet or something to, to kind of set us free and let us breathe a little bit. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, these other, these teams are going up against, like I said, if they're organized, they understand that, you know, a guy like Petrasso is a, a really big threat. So if they, they can take him out of the game or focus on, you know, kind of trapping him a little bit, then, then we're going to, then we might struggle. Um, but yeah, like, I think if you look at it, like we all had kind of our day, our days, you know what I mean? Bustos had some games where he was man of the match. I had a man of the match game against Calgary, you know, some other Petrasso had a really good game. So it was kind of like, it wasn't like uh, we could all step up at the same time, you know? So it was hard to find, like you said, it's hard to find that balance when you have similar players. Um, it's difficult because we kind of all want the ball to our feet, right? But if you're always getting it to feet, you're always kind of playing in front of a team or it's, it's, it's easier to defend in that sense. So. Oliver, Oliver, can, you know, was Valor the best football playing team in the CPL, as Rob Gale said it was? No, I don't think so, because I think you have to have more... <laughs> Yeah, you have to have a more complete game than, than maybe Valor showed at times to be described in that way. But, you know, I, I was looking through the season earlier today and, and yesterday and looking at some of the standout games. And the one that, the good one that stood out to me was that game at York 9, which I think was your last game, Dylan, before you went to, to New Zealand. Uh, you were excellent in that game. You scored a, a really good goal. But the whole team just seemed to click and, and play some really fluid football. Um, is there something from that game that you can kind of pick out that, was working that hadn't been working for the rest of the year it was a it's a smaller field and it and fit our mm -hmm. players i think and that's my opinion like the coach or anyone might not agree with me but uh i think that with the style of players that we had we fit we fitted that york field it's just smaller it's tidier you could you can advance quicker right it doesn't i don't know it, it just felt like an easier pitch to play on and for some reason, it suited us because we went there and beat them twice. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. So for some reason, it, it suited our team a little bit more. And, and then you come to investors group and it's a huge field. And we didn't particularly have great performances at home. So uh, I don't know. Obviously, there's an argument that the field doesn't matter, the size. But if you have, you know, if you're saying you have a bit more technical, shorter, shorter playing players, then, you know, maybe a smaller field does suit you a little bit more. Um, but I, don't, I was really up for that game, honestly. Like, it was just one of those days where I kind of had a feeling like I need to, I don't know, I need to show something. Like, I was playing against my old coaches, Jimmy, Brandon, and Carm. A lot of guys on York I'd played against my whole life, or my, my whole life, but growing up in, playing in Toronto. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know, I just... It felt like one of those games where I was really up for it. So I remember being disappointed after that game because our great hope was that York 9 was going to be able to make a run at, uh, what was it, at Forge, Oliver Platt? And then that way we'd actually have a title race because you guys going to York 9 and winning pretty much made it certain that Forge would play uh, Calvary in the finals. So thanks a lot. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that was the first one. <laughs> That was the 2-0, yeah. no, and, and then York did exactly the same thing against Pacific the, right, the before or afterwards, right? So anyway, it's an interesting point, though, because you would think that, like, a, a smaller technical team that is probably going to play better in tight spaces, right, and, and was suited to a, a smaller yeah. pitch like that. So, yeah, it, it was definitely an interesting factor. Yeah, interesting point, Dylan. Quick to point that out as well. Uh, we have a question uh, from Twitter, uh, from at Puddinbox. Uh, he wants to know, how do you think the League of Ireland compares – to CPL and a quick reminder, if anyone has any questions for Dylan Sacramento on the YouTube chat, feel free to fire them up and we'll try to get to them. So how do you think uh, League of Ireland compares to CPL? Just a couple of games in, you had a quick uh, glimpse yeah. at it. What are your yeah, thoughts? Yeah. Uh, you know, we had a few preseason games against the top, top flight sides and we played Shamrock Rovers, we played St. Pat's and these are teams that have been in and around Europa League. Um, so my first game there against Shamrock, um, you know, I didn't start the game. I just flown in from New Zealand, like about four or four or five days before. And I'm watching the game and I'm just like, Jesus, these guys are whipping the ball around like fast. Like, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm like, wow, this, and then some guys on the bench are like, yeah, that guy on Shamrock, their left back there has 200 games in the England championship. That guy has 200 games in league one England. 
Uh, and so you're looking at their squad and you're like, okay, these guys, you know, they're, they're serious players. And then same thing. I start next preseason game against St. Pat's. I start and uh, playing against uh, I think their defensive midfielder just signed from Aberdeen in Scotland. So, you know, you're playing against these high level players that, you know, but then I'm looking at them and I'm like, ah, there's players in Canada, you know, similar levels. It's just, it's just a matter of uh, kind of sometimes where you've grown up, what academy you went through and, and other things to land in those situations. Right. Um, but overall, the, the competitive uh, culture that's in Ireland is, is huge. Yeah. That's the so, so what I was going to ask you about, Dylan. I was going to ask you about the kind of the difference in compete level. Cause we had Paul Stahl Terry on here uh, a few weeks ago and he just had mentioned <clears throat> that while players might be similar, there just seems to be a different edge about, you know, how, how players train in Europe. And, and, and I imagine just knowing a lot of Irish players myself, the intensity level uh, has got to be extreme. Is there a difference that, between just the, the way players go about things overseas? Oh yeah. Just every day. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a constant focus more than anything. Like you can see when training starts, there's no laughing around really. There's no, you know, players might tell each other off but it's never personal in that sense because everyone just wants to win when we play small-sided when we're playing these 11 v 11 games like tackles are flying like guys are you know like no no fear whatsoever and, and the manager you know they they set that tone in a sense there because they're so we have about like four coaches on the field at all times and they're so particular and so um intense in the way they go about things but in a, a good way you know what i mean like they they just they try and really like for myself I thought I was training well and the coach comes to me and he's like I need you to do more and I'm like okay I guess I gotta even try and pick it up a little bit more you know what I mean so that's that for me is just it's uh, the culture like you said the the intensity that they go about things at like in a passing drill or anything like there's no lacks there's no taking a break or a pass off or anything if you make one little bad pass it's almost like like hey you know what I mean? Like, make sure the next one's good. Like, and they just make it known. I don't know. It's it's just a different, different vibe, I guess. And it, it comes from the players as well, but it, it comes a lot through management. How do you find you're fitting in so far? What are your expectations for the season? Yeah, there. I mean, the way we play fits me really well because we play with uh, inverted uh, wide players. So I kind of the first game that I started, I was kind of on the left, but like playing inverted so that our fullbacks can kind of push on. Uh, we have good good athletic fullbacks, so that's kind of the, the way we try to play is utilize them wide, try and get a ball in, and into midfield quickly and, and get us on a half turn so we can find a passer. And it, it suits me a lot. So, uh, you know, I've, I have high expectations for myself. And, uh, like, I'm, I'm really it, – it's going to be tough, though, because we have a lot of good players in the team. Like, we're 27 guys deep, and everyone in that squad has either played in the top flight or has extensive amount in the second division. Um, so like Galway's project there, that's what really drove me to sign there was the project they had. I mean, when the manager called me, he's like, look, we're going for promotion this year and next year and the following year, we want to be in Europe. And if you look up Galway United, like they've got really good investing and backing that, uh, you know, the Comer brothers who, who bought the club a few years back and, you know, they're really on a, on a really cool pathway. And it's, uh, when you get a chance to sign in Europe, you know, being, like from Canada that you watch the European leagues your whole life, uh, it's, it's hard to turn down. So for me, that was the, the biggest thing was just putting myself in a, in a position that, you know, there's, first of all, there's maybe more eyes watching you. And mm -hmm. second of all, it's just a different culture that I, that I personally wanted to experience. Going back to, to what you were saying about, you know, the intensity of training and, and how it maybe differs in Europe compared to, to Canada did you find that Valor maybe lacked a little bit of that? Like I, we, we've talked to Tristan Borges and he'll tell you that Carl Becker was huge for him and just in terms of just setting the tone of, and expectations for the group and training and, and things like that. Was there a bit of a lack of that at Valor? Would that be fair to say? I think uh, maybe, I think majority of players were really had the competitive nature in them. Yeah. But when you have a maybe, I don't know, it could be two or three that are just not up for it on the day. And I think that happened quite often where you just, you know, it's, it's hard to, how do you motivate a player that's not playing and that doesn't look like they're going to play. And it's, it's such a mental thing, right. For like us as players or anything, like how do you show up every day and want to put in your best effort? Right. So 
there in, in Ireland, it was just from the get go, it was kind of like, it's a long season and they made it clear that players would get a chance. So, I mean, so far it's early and things, like I said, at Valor early on were, were great. And everyone was like, you know, in preseason really up for it and stuff. Uh, but it, it gets more challenging throughout the year. So when you're not playing, right, how do you deal with those things? How it, it's tough for, I could imagine it's really hard for a manager to, to be able to, to keep people happy, right? You can't keep everyone happy. So I don't know. It's tough to say right now because we were so early in the season and, and it's so easy that everyone's still, you know, up and battling early on. But I, I don't, I don't imagine that they would allow that in a culture in Ireland for a player to, to not show up and give a hundred percent of training. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's maybe, yeah. I don't know. All right. We have a question from our YouTube chat now and this uh, could start our, uh, Valor FC rapid fire. Adam is asking uh, Dylan for his favorite part of playing in CPL. Uh, just playing at home at investors group in front of friends and family. That was, that was really special. Yeah. The second part of that is the least favorite part. Least favorite, uh, the early morning travels. Three, yeah. three 4 a.m. wake up calls. Not fun before day before a game. Yeah. You, you guys had the shortest travel in the league, didn't you? You can't complain that much. Oh, I'm not, but it takes a toll on you, you know, uh, even, from, you know, even from here, it was like, what, five and a half, six hours. No, I know, I know. Yeah. Halifax, right. So, yeah. but the thing is, if you're doing that the day before a game, it puts your routine out of completely out of order. Cause you're waking up at 3am like it and you're the day before or two days before your game day is usually your most important sleep per se. So yeah. it, it, it throws things off. Mm -hmm. uh, best pitch in the CPL. Uh, York's. Like it was definitely, <laughs> no, seriously though, it was yeah. perfectly flat. Like the ball wouldn't bounce on you, you know? Yeah. But, Dimensions didn't bother you. Obviously you, you enjoyed playing uh, yeah. a smaller pitch. Uh, worst pitch in CPL? I think majority of the turf fields are, are evenly bad. Yeah. <laughs> They're just not bouncy, man. The ball doesn't move the way, like it's not natural, right? It, it's, it's different. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next CPL player to move on to MLS. Who do you think that is? Uh, see, I want to say I want to say a guy like Carducci would get a shot, kind of like a Cripo, right? Yeah. But it, with the Canadian rules in MLS and and players being foreign, uh, you know, actually he would probably wouldn't count, right? If you're over the 15, 15 before you're fifteen in Canada or something. Or in MLS Academy, yeah, yeah. not international. Yeah, he might not count because he came through the White Cups, right? But I'm not sure. Yeah, I'll go with him then. Yeah. Well, I mean, let me give you this name, Dominic Zator. <laughs> that was going to be my second one. To Thank you. Yeah. On. What He's about you, man? Bustos. Player. Bustos for sure. I think can can get there. It's just, it, I feel like it's harder for attacking players because they want to sign their right. DPs and they sign the big money guys, right? Look at Joel Waterman. Like he's a class player. Like he got a chance, you know. It could have been yeah. Zatora. Could have been yeah. either, right? So yeah. they're both in that situation. And Didich is in there too. So yeah, yeah. let's go right yeah. there. Then that's the next rapid fire question. Best defender in CPL: Zatora, Crutzen, uh, Didich, maybe somebody else. Who do you think it is? The hardest to get by. Yeah. For me, I when I watch Trafford, just it's hard to beat that to beat him. I think like when I watch. Even the other games, he doesn't get beat often. And I, not that the other guys do, but he's his experience. I would say he's probably the, the most well-rounded defender in the league. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Good yeah. stuff, good rapid fire, nice and quick. All right, let's move on to New Zealand. We touched on Galway. Uh, we're currently playing. Um, but that short stint in New Zealand, uh, leaving Ballard to go to New Zealand, uh, three goals and eight appearances. So what was that experience like for you, Dylan? It was good. It was uh, it was a, a lot different playing style than uh, than I'd say here or in, in CPL. It was a bit more, I'd say the CPL is like a bit more uh, athletic in a sense, and and maybe uh, a bit even more technical uh, in that sense. Uh, a little bit faster gameplay because I think the teams were more evenly matched in CPL aside from maybe Calgary and Forge. But yeah. then um, you go to New Zealand and you know you got Auckland City, whose payroll is probably higher than than all the CPL teams <laughs> and they've got, you know, some, some really good players who, if you look at their team, they just signed a guy from second Bundesliga, J league, uh, South African premier league. Um, even though it's not considered a professional league on paper, um, 
there is some really good teams and Auckland city goes club world cup uh, team Wellington. Uh, you got Eastern suburbs and, and these are, you know, these clubs have, have some money so they can pull in some good players, you know? Um, and then overall uh, from, from Hawks Bay standpoint, we had some, some really talented players there too. And then going into Christmas, you know, we're in third place. So I think maybe we're overachieving a little bit, but you know, that's where we want it to be. So for me, it was good. And I felt important in that team. I felt like I, you know, I had four assists as well in those eight games and probably could have had a lot more and we'd get our instat reports back and all that. And I was in second or third in the league in key passes. So I, you know, I was, I was contributing a lot to that team and uh, I enjoyed my time there a lot. And then, yeah, uh, after Christmas, obviously a few options in Europe came up. So I had to make a decision. Bill, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, you know, the current, uh, what, what appears to be a current movement uh, by the CPL players to, to organize and, 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 and to unionize now that we know they're not very far along in the process. The commissioner of the CPL has now done multiple interviews where he's talked about having not really received anything and not really knowing too much about it. But there is a website. There are players uh, outwardly involved in it. Um, just as somebody who took part in the first year and somebody who still talks to former teammates in the CPL. I mean, what are your thoughts on just the, the idea of there being a player regime in the CPL? Right. So I don't know too much about the legalities and obviously the stuff that commissioners talked about. I'm not too familiar with how it works to even start a union or what it takes to, to make it a good one in that sense. Um, so, but what I do know is that they are evident or they are in every other country in the world that has a pro league pretty much. So in Ireland, we have one. Um, you know, the MLS obviously has one, um, and I don't know how long they, they take to, to get going or how long anything, but I do know that it's important from, uh, for myself as a player's perspective that, you know, you have some backing there for you that, you know, because at the end of the day, there's a lot of agents out there and they might not all be particular great ones. So you, you might be put in a situation where the union might have to stand up for you in a situation. So I think it's important for the players, definitely. And uh, whether or not it's, it's going to establish itself quickly in Canada, I'm not sure. But, you know, I think definitely you can't argue that it's not a good thing. What have you learned from the uh, PFA in Ireland? Uh, have you had any involvement with them? Yeah, so they actually uh, came to our club, did a whole presentation there and, uh, they talked about a lot of things uh, just in terms of if you're not getting paid on time, uh, other things that can happen, uh, which is, is, I wouldn't say common, but in Europe, you know, things like that can happen. Um, just, just how to go about things, who, who to talk to, um, where, where you can contact them, how you can kind of make it um, discreet in a way. I don't, they, they went through a lot of things that yeah. you know, I learned a lot from that presentation because I'd never been, you know, I'm like, oh, wow, I'm thinking in the past, I'm like, oh, you know, things could have been different for me in different situations, but like they, they're just there to help the player. They're literally, that was the, the conclusion of it was anything you guys need, we might be able to help. So don't be afraid to come forward. So that, that was great. Would you like to um, come back to the CPR eventually, Dylan, or are you kind of ready to go wherever football takes you? No, I really would. And uh, I mean, I'm 25 now. So going to Europe was for me, it was like now or never in a sense. Because uh, I don't I think once you hit maybe it, it, like 28, 29, if you haven't played in Europe yet, it's going to be really hard to get in. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was it was a, a really important time now to make that decision. But I 100 percent would love to go back to the CPL and, you know, whether that's in a couple of years or next year, whatever happens, you, you can't really tell um you know maybe someone won't maybe teams won't want me after right you don't you don't know the future so it's uh it, all you can do is focus on where you are now but uh you know I love I love what the CPL is doing I love what it stands for to have this platform you know as a Canadian player it's 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 massive right so I 100% support the league through everything so yeah I would love to be a part of it again as it continues to grow would it be going back to Winnipeg a few Winnipeggers have, have left Valor uh, you don't, you never know, right? Uh, they might not want me, so <laughs> we'll see uh, what what happens when the if the time comes. But uh, you know, I, I would obviously you'd love to play at home. So if that comes up again, then yeah, I'll have to see what makes sense. How how do you kind of reflect on, on last year on a personal level? Because 
people maybe don't remember that you came out of League One Ontario as the MVP. You had an amazing seat last season there, and and then you're a Winnipeg-born kid playing for for Valor. Um, did it go to kind of your expectations on on a personal level, or do you feel maybe a little disappointment? No, I'm disappointed with it because I mean, if you look at the League One, how many guys did we have come through League One that? 100% would have had a way more notable season than I did in, in CPO, right? And the year before that, I'm, I'm the, the MVP in the league, right? And I'm thinking, okay, I can come in and really do well. And other guys really did. Like Tristan Borges played in League One the year before as well, and maybe not the full year. And you could obviously see he was a talented player. But then the next year, things really fell for him, right? And he, he, he did really well. So sometimes it depends on where you are for Vaughn I was the man in that team right like I, I was in my position every game I played every single game I you know I found myself in scoring opportunities often uh you know and then in the following year I didn't so it was it was a tough tough transition for me um but you know and, and you know another thing that I probably people don't really realize is the mental side of it when you're when you're living at home and playing at home when the team's not doing well who do you think everyone wants to talk bad about it to yeah. The local players. Right. Yeah. So you got your, you got your friends and your family and everyone, you know, you can't get away from it literally. So you, you go to training and then the rest of the, all like after every game, it's like constant, like talking and talking and talking. Right. So it's, it was, uh, I don't know. I almost found it like to be overwhelming sometimes that I just didn't want to, didn't want to talk about football anymore. Or I just want to, you know, chill out a little bit. Mm-hmm. And that's where it's nice where my girlfriend's not really doesn't know too much about soccer. So she, she, I don't have to come home to her having a big opinion. So that's kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff, Dylan. Well, uh, yeah, I think career was the last one, right? Uh, everyone moved out. Uh, Atardo, Bustos, yourself. Did you guys have many of those discussions being Winnipeggers playing for Valor? Sorry, I don't, I don't really. Did get, you guys have many you discussions mean like everyone... about the, the pressure playing at home? Oh, uh, no, I wouldn't say not, not between us. Um, I I think it was more like external things because people don't see what goes on day in, day out. Right. So then uh, everyone's opinion is, is obviously, you know, it's there, but you, you kind of have to just play it off or, or whatever. Right. So, uh, between the players, obviously we wanted to try and keep things as positive as possible. And there was never really negativity in the group. It's just, we just couldn't gel for some reason. I'm not, you know, there's obviously a lot of factors to that, but yeah. Well, what's one thing that you would have done differently, uh, going into the season with the makeup of the team at Valor FC to change the results? One thing, uh, <laughs> that's tough. Cause there's probably a lot of things that didn't go right for us, but if I could have one thing different, um, struggling to find something here. Uh, Dylan, did you, did you ever, did you ever feel like, did you ever feel like it was more difficult to attract players to, to Winnipeg and Manitoba? It just seemed like the coastal teams, they had this allure of playing, in, in, in beautiful cities and you had Calvary and Forge, obviously they had feeder clubs there. Do you think Winnipeg and, 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 and Valor was kind of up against it from the beginning? Maybe a little bit in a sense. Um, I mean, you got a guy like Petrasso who would probably, yeah. you know, the biggest name in the league before like the year started. Right. Yeah. And whether that was, you know, I don't know what happened, like personally with his contract, if any other teams were coming in for him or what, but he chose Valor. Right. So I don't think, I mean, there was, we had a strong team, I think, but at the beginning of the season, maybe people were looking at our team and saying, okay, like this guy's got drafted by MLS, this guy, you know, played here, this guy there. And, you know, it looked like we could really put something together, but, uh, you know, going back to the last question, maybe just a more consistent lineup in a sense, right? Yeah. Whether I was in that lineup or not, then, you know, you can't control, like you can only do what you can do on the training pitch to be able to get in. Um, so that's maybe more to give, you know, because it just felt like, oh, you, you had a so-so game and then you kind of get dropped a little bit, right? So it's tough as a player, right? You want to get a chance if it's three, four games in a row and you want to show yourself, but mm-hmm. it's, yeah. 
All right, so Dylan, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us today on The Hangout. It's a late call up and stepped up to it and we appreciate that. I want to remind everyone to uh, stay inside and subscribe to our One Soccer YouTube channel. Plenty of great content there. Gareth Wheeler coming up later tonight with Tim Bez Pachenko. That should be amazing. And uh, Adam Jenkins is back on The Hangout tomorrow. Till then, see you later. All right, thanks guys. Thanks, Thanks Dylan.